You know, I have a lot of pride at the Edge of Chaos and a tremendous amount of pride in calling Dr. Max Michael or Dean Michael a friend. Please. And I will guarantee you, when I finish, that pride will be diminished. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, uh, uh, you know, there's a precursor here. I'll give you kind of a, a table of contents, how it's going to go. I'm going to bore the bejesus out of you at first. And if that's not enough, I'm going to throw up some slides and charts. And if you haven't, uh, if you aren't asleep or have left, I will be completely shocked. I uh, will have people take pulses. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I consider almost every one of you in this room a friend, and uh, it is an honor to be a part of the Edge of Chaos, uh, and also, uh, I can't say naked catfish, can I? It's naked. It's, now, that implies something else, and so it's a naked catfisher. Anyway, uh, how the Grinch stole science is uh, kind of my look at opportunities that are out there and opportunities lost. Um, especially as it relates to technology-based economic development. You know, in 1822, President uh, Madison had the great foresight to be with us, I think, spiritually and intellectually today, because he's, he said that knowledge will forever govern ignorance. And a people who need to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. In other words, government should help fund some of the ideas that science takes and delivers, but don't ever, ever give up on owning those ideas. And I think if he were with us today, he would be very, very impressed with that. So let's look at American research universities. And we think about those, and we take them for granted. I know that you know, being an outsider looking in and into UAB and other universities throughout the South and the country, uh, they really are. I mean, research universities are the foundation for our competitive advantages and our standard of living in this country. And, and we do take them for granted. You know, also. We think that our country has been dysfunctional in Washington, and, and, and Richwood, our good friend from Catalyst Partners DC, lives that every day as part of what goes on there. But in 2005, a bipartisan congressional group uh, asked the National Academies of Science to identify key steps uh, in taking science and technology to ensure that uh, we are prepared in the 21st century for global um, economic strengths. In 2012, the National Research Council of the National Council National Academies of Science, published a follow-up. And uh, thank you, you and Alexander, for um, sharing this with me. But this is the follow-up. And I, you know, if you'd like to read it right now, I'll give it to you. Uh, but um, in other words, the title was Research Universities in the Future of America, 10 Breakthrough Action, uh, Actions for Vital to Our Nation's Prosperity and Security. And you know, security comes in so many different ways today. Uh, I came from the entertainment industry. I was uh, in the broadcasting industry for 32 years. Never in my life have I seen a movie studio shut down the release of a movie mm -hmm. due to the threat of a cyber crime. And uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's unprecedented. It is fascinating. And I guess we'd be able to link this straight back to the North Koreans. Uh, what I want to know is where's Gary Warner and the Center for Information Assurance and Joint Forensic Research when we need them? Because uh, obviously we're not going to see that movie on Christmas Day. So where's the Grinch in UAB, Bill? Uh, I don't sing, I don't dance, but there are really challenges facing research universities today. And the first one is, we all know that federal funding for university research has been unstable. In other words, and I hate to use this term, but it's true, it has become a political football. And when you think about the ups and downs of sequestration, uh, what uh, one side of the house and what the other side believes and doesn't believe is scientifically valid and true, uh, you really see that it, it's happening at a time when we can least afford it to happen. So also what's happened is other countries have continued to invest significantly in science and technology and research and development while we have played football with it. State funding for higher education has been cut further in the recent recession, and we know that. Um, I think those, we have what, three deans here? And um, Eric? And Max, you've been around the longest. Um, how much has our strict state appropriation for UAB, has it been flat? $100 million. $100 million cuts. Probably 22%, 25%. That's real money. So as other parts of the, of the world are, are increasing research and development dollars in science and technology, our state continues to cut. Business and industry have largely dismantled large corporate research laboratories, and there's nothing more evident 
than the demise of Bell Labs. And when you think about all of the brilliance that came out of Bell Labs, things that we take completely for granted today, I would dare say that if we didn't have Bell Labs, we probably wouldn't have some of this. We certainly wouldn't have MP3 music files. We wouldn't have a lot of other telecommunications uh, technologies that we have. So what's happened is, and, and Joel, you saw this in the, pharma, in the pharmaceutical industry, how many pharma, pharma companies had to cut back of their um, R&D efforts because of declining profit opportunities? And last but not least, research universities need to be responsive to stakeholders by improving management, productivity, and cost efficiency in both administration and academics. And we know that's been debated hotly uh, in this town for the past couple of weeks as uh, football was eliminated at UAB. But it is. I mean, if you're an administrator, uh, chief administrator for a university, you have a fiduciary relationship to manage the business as it is. And these are very, very difficult decisions. So there are 10 vital action items that the NRC and the NAS project uh, published. Number one, within the broad framework of US innovation, the federal government should adopt stable policies that will, one, further support R&D effort at research universities, support R&D efforts, stabilize those, we're at a time that we have to have more consistent funding. In the two years of sequestration, I believe it was the NIH was down 14.8% in two years. That's 12 and 13, I believe. That's, the, that's real money. Secondly, we need to support graduate education. We need to shore up graduates and graduate education programs that industry and that government and other resources are looking for for us to um, turn to. Oops, sorry. And last, we need to produce a new stream of knowledge and educated people to power our future. Never before have we seen such a need for intellectual capacity on this globe that we have right now. And if we're not keeping pace, the world will catch up to us. Number two, we need to provide greater autonomy for public research universities to leverage local and regional strengths. Think about that. Greater autonomy. That's also been discussed a lot in the last few weeks in this community. Uh, but we don't, we're not agile. You know, I look at UAB, and coming from a business perspective, I can honestly say that, that it is a leviathan. It is a very slow-moving boat when you try to turn around ideas and opportunities with, with inside a research university like UAB that is so complex. Secondly, we need to restore state appropriations for higher education, including graduate education and research. Imagine if we had that $100 million back over the next two years, what it would do for UAB from our state. And third, autonomy allows public research universities to operate at world-class levels. In other words, we can adapt and meet market needs and conditions so much faster <coughs> with autonomy. Action item number three, and this is something that I, I, I talk a lot about. We need to strengthen the business role in research partnerships. By that we mean we need to facilitate the transfer of knowledge. Early, earlier we talked about that major corporations, companies, industry have cut back their R&D efforts. Well, I believe that we hold a key and a solution point for a lot of different industries, a lot of different industries on this campus. So we need to facilitate how we work with those industries and those businesses so that we can transfer this huge wealth of knowledge that we have here. Secondly, we need to accelerate time to innovation. Think about this. Think if we had an idea from a lab that was proven, that we found some kind of proof of concept funding for that was able to hit the market within a year to two years. Now, that is a fast timeline. We think about the speed of Silicon Valley. We, you know, we, everybody talks about the, billion, the instant billionaires. Front when you know, I, I'm a huge Uber user. Wherever I go, that has Uber. I'm a huge Uber user. The company is worth forty-some million billion dollars today. It's what four years old? That's unheard of. It's purely a technology company. They didn't invent cars. They didn't invent gasoline. They didn't invent taxis. They invented a technology where we could utilize cars and gasoline to get around cities better and faster and cheaper. Third, society does gain from the transfer of ideas and technology. And George, I will never forget a conversation at Max's house we had one night about science for the sake of science. Well, what's it going to do to help people? How's it going to translate to the street? 
And I'm saying that science for the sake of science is important because that is where true intellectual wisdom and brilliance emanates. However, those ideas, many of those ideas, have to find a common good for the good of mankind. And I believe that we can find a faster way, a more effective way, to take these societal gains through technology and, and transfer and um, intellectual capacity. I think we're, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a global community, we're better off. Number four, increase university cost effectiveness and productivity. Boy, this is a tough one. We need to provide a greater return for taxpayers because who pays for us? You know, we don't think about it, but you know, when we pay our, our FICAs and, and, and we pay our, our state, our federal, and our regional, and taxes and everything, well, part of what we pay in comes back to us. I think if we didn't have the 90-some blocks of UAB in, in Birmingham right now, well, thank you, taxpayers, for having the faith and the wisdom to invest in us. Number two, we need a greater return for philanthropists and foundations. If we don't have philanthropy, the government, the state, cannot make up the difference. We have to believe in our philanthropic partners and the foundations that make up philanthropy also. And number three, we need a greater return for corporations and industry research partners. We need to show that we go into, I'll call it business, I know you don't like that sometimes, but we go into business with you, that we're going to deliver for you in a timely, effective way that's going to help move that, that idea from the lab and the bench to a product. Number five, we need to create a strategic investment program. Think about that strategic investment in science and technology. Now, there has been a, a tremendous amount of investment. When you look at the NIH and the NSF and other funding opportunities that really, really, we are very closely tied to at this university. Well, we need to fund initiatives at the research university that are critical to advancing education and research to, to advance key national priorities. Right now, we have some of the best cybersecurity experts in the country. We need more. We need to be able to attract more. We need somebody to help us fund the attraction of more world-class talent in cybersecurity in this campus, because without it, if the North Koreans can shut down a movie studio, can you imagine what other corners of the globe can do and are doing? So right there, we need stability in strategic investment programs, a program that expands and contracts to changing needs and opportunities. Let's face it, not every bench, not every laboratory is efficient. It's not effective. It doesn't mean that that money can't be spent more wisely other places. We need to be honest with ourselves as a research university to do that. Last, universities should bring in states, business, philanthropy, et cetera, that will support matching funds. In other words, if we get monies from a federal grant of some kind, what are our philanthropic partners going to do to match? Maybe that's a requirement. Maybe that is, you know, to get this fund, there has to be a real dollar for dollar match. I don't think that's unreasonable. I don't think it's I don't think it is unlikely that we should ask that. Because that way you have science and effectiveness and delivery all tied into one, showing that the, the philanthropic dollar is going to go further. <coughs> Action item six, the federal government research sponsors should pay the full cost of project of research projects. And this is one that I, I think is probably controversial on college campuses about uh, direct and indirect cost. And certainly the academicians can, can discuss this and debate this, but uh, shift federal funding from direct to indirect costs for no net change in cost to government. Uh, and, and also allow more strategic allocation of resources for intended purposes. There's a real debate that, that there should be a national uh, indirect cost floor. What is it here, 47.5%, 48%, something like that? That's a big number. So for every $1 sponsored research that you want to get uh, or go after, you have to add another 475 to 48% on top of that. It sometimes prices us out of the market. Number seven, reduce or eliminate regulations that increase administrative costs. Oh, 
can impede productivity and deflect creative energy. Can you imagine how much we spend in administrative costs just in sponsored research programs? I mean, and how, how much it takes to get a sponsored research opportunity through the system. It is a huge amount of money just for a, a, a campus like UAB. If you multiply that times the number of research universities throughout the United States, that is a big number. So we need to eliminate federal and state regulations that are redundant, that are ineffective, or inappropriately applied to higher education. How many times are we held to a standard or a, a, a statute in the state of Alabama that really applies to other industries, but we have to be beholden to it? Last, the AAU, the APLU, and Cougar, Council on Government Relations, agree that a major cost, that there's a major cost and benefit by just streamlining the administrative cost and to, uh, to be more efficient. Number eight, we need to improve the capacity of graduate programs to attract talented and students. Um, I don't know the answer to this, but you know, Tim, you and uh, Eric, you might. What's the attrition rate of graduate students at UAB? What percentage? Any idea? Fifty-five percent. How much? Thirty percent. Yeah. So think we didn't have that attrition rate. I think we were able to keep them here and through the completion of their degree. Uh, and the time to that degree. And think how much time it takes for them to complete the degree. Um, I'm always amazed at the length of time it takes to complete an undergraduate degree at UAB. What is it, four and a half, five years? Five or six years? 53% of undergraduates graduate within six years or so. But don't we have a problem that we have too many PhDs we're training? So if we reduce attrition rates, then we're going to have even more PhDs who are now doing seven-year postdocs instead of finding jobs. So how do we, I mean, I agree we need to attract more talented students, but maybe not, maybe the answer isn't to grow our PhD programs, it's to shrink them and only attract the talented students. Well, what's also happened, when you think about a lot of uh, PhD uh, candidates, once they complete their degrees, they think they're going into the laboratories. And those lab jobs are not there right now. That's right. There's so we've got to find ways to attract, I think, continue to attract great students, but also prepare them for jobs outside of the lab. Uh, I know we, um, and, and Deb, Dr. Debbie Bedanz is back there, but we work with postdocs to help us determine the validity of some of the technologies we're working on. Well, we're actually giving them a new job skill because many of them will not find jobs in labs. And that's a sad state. <clears throat> and last, funding and alignment with student career opportunities in national interest. So in other words, let's align what the uh, what is being taught, what's available, to the national opportunities and career opportunities that are hiring, that are looking for those candidates. Number nine, secure for the U.S. full benefits of education for all Americans, including women and underrepresented minorities in STEM. Um, I was just talking to uh, Ron Sparks about a program that he is doing in the Black Belt. And it is exactly what needs to go to be going on. I know that UAB is working very closely uh, with local uh, junior and senior uh, high schools uh, in, in the STEM uh, curriculum. So it is something that is really, our, I think, our responsibility here as a research university and as a beacon of academic capacity. Uh, research universities should engage in K-12 outreach to improve access and completion in their own institutions. Secondly, research universities should assist uh, teacher preparation for K-12 STEM education. Many of them are not prepared to teach the curriculum. So we need to be, I think, a, uh, an avenue or a conduit to uh, assist. And last, we should be a stable funded uh, priority for America the Heats Act and the Office of Technology and Science Policy. But too often, again, those become political footballs, even though they are uh, official acts, there's an official office. Too many times, 
the funding opportunities get cut or delineated from what the true mission is. And last but not least, we need to ensure that the U.S. will continue to benefit strongly from international students and scholars in our research enterprise. Um, and again, that includes a visa process that is streamlined for international students and scholars. It's efficient and effective and last, it needs to be consistent with homeland security considerations. Those are the 10 vital action points that came out of the National Academies of Science and the National Research Council. So I take that and I think, okay, really, does it make your puzzler sore? <laughs> now, if you're, if you're a Grinch aficionado, you'll know what I'm talking about. And it kind of does. Because what I'm going to do now is drill this, this high-level look at, from a national perspective, of what um, some really, really bright and very well-intentioned people committed a tremendous amount of time researching and delivering, and take it to the state level. Well, we do like to hunt elephants in Alabama, don't we? <laughs> well, not this kind. You know, our, our state's economic development model really is, has been about elephants. And when you look at the huge amount of money that's being spent to get Mercedes, Airbus, Honda, ThyssenKrupp, which is not even here anymore, I believe. Is that correct, David? No. Gone. Uh, how many millions of dollars were spent recruiting ThyssenKrupp and, and tax incentives and everything? Uh, and Honda. So these are the types of elephants that we'd like to hunt here. But we're really missing the gem. We're missing the true opportunity in Alabama. Because Alabama's real potential growth lies in life sciences, biotechnology, and engineering research and development. I'm not leaning out any, any area of science, but it's so true. We have so many opportunities in this state because we are rich. It was Mike Cassidy in 2006, and a room full of Birmingham leaders said, if we had UAB in Atlanta, we feel we could rival the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. That's a pretty strong statement. That's how much UAB is revered at the Georgia Research Alliance. Mike is the president and CEO of the Georgia Research Alliance. It's been, it's been open for business for 24 years. And he said, we like Emory. We covet UAB. <laughs> so let's talk about innovation capacity and economic dynamism. Innovation capacity is defined. Uh, the Kauffman Foundation started this, uh, and it's been completed by um, the State New Economy Index by the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. So innovation capacity measures the number of PhDs um, you have in a state, the number of wet and dry labs that you have, the amount of research and development dollars that come into your state. Uh, it looks at um, the diversity of the science and technologies that have been invested in. So as you see, look at Colorado. Uh, it has a pretty high innovation capacity. and I. And I I like to look at the southeast, but I'm going to pull out Colorado also. And the reason I do is because Colorado and Alabama, surprisingly, are very, very similar in terms of population base. It has a very liberal central urban center in Denver, and it gets very, very, uh, shall we say, conservative outside of uh, the hinterlands of Colorado. Uh, when you look at the numbers of research universities, uh, we actually have more research universities in the state of Alabama than Colorado does. They have the University of Colorado at Boulder and Denver. Uh, they have Colorado State. And beyond that, there's not a lot of other research universities that are going on there. So Colorado, I kind of look at as a phoenix. It's kind of risen from the ashes and exploded. So in innovation capacity, Colorado ranks number six. But in economic dynamism, and, and dynamism is defined by entrepreneurialism taking that innovation capacity and turning it into meaningful business opportunities, turning it into startups, turning it into an ecosystem that supports all of this. They go to all the way to number two. Virginia, ninth in the country in innovation capacity, economic dynamism, 16. So they don't take quite as good a care of their innovation capacity. North Carolina, 22nd in innovation capacity, 21st in economic dynamism. I thought it would be more, but it's not. Uh, Georgia, 25th and 13th. Georgia does a pretty good job creating opportunity off of economic uh, uh, innovation capacity. <coughs> look at Alabama. We're 26th in innovation capacity. But look at our economic dynamism. All the way to 49th. That is an embarrassment. Look at Florida. 
32nd in capacity, 6th in dynamism. And do you know why they've been turned into an economically dynamic state? Anybody have any idea? 9-11. What happened was, then Governor Jeb Bush said, people are not going to be coming here for tourism. What are we going to do? So he started investing state funds in building up innovation capacity and ways to take that capacity and turn it into meaningful economic opportunities. That's why Florida has grown so much. Their capacity has not caught up to their dynamism. They are turning out a tremendous number of startups and entrepreneurial uh, businesses in Florida. That's a big, that's a huge, huge, huge victory. South Carolina is what you would expect. Tennessee, I think, is a disappointment because there's been over $200 million in what are called 10 Invesco funds, and I'll talk about that in a moment, that have been invested in the state. I think it's a lag time. I think, I think they will catch up. And then you see Kentucky and Louisiana. But look at that, right here. 26, and we go to 49. So have we invested in technology-based economic development? Well, compared to Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina, our support has been negligible. Look at this. The Georgia Research Alliance is 24 years old. Uh, it's, a, it's a tripart consortium. It includes public sector, government, it includes the private sector, local business, and it includes eight designated research universities. So over that 24-year period, about $595 million has been invested in the Georgia Research Alliance. They have a program there called Eminent Scholars, and I have no idea how many eminent scholars the Georgia Research Alliance has hired from UAB, but it's a pretty sizable number. In fact, the Georgia Research Alliance calls Bottega the recruiting captain. <laughs> <laughs> because they say, if you don't, you don't know us, you don't know your own people. But we're here a lot of Monday nights because it's the best restaurant that's open in Birmingham on Monday night and we're just going to take their talent because we can give them a seven-figure package and you can't. On top of the $595 million, another $3.8 billion of federal and private investment monies have come into Georgia because of the Georgia Research Alliance. So they have multiplied the public-private research university investment into a major external investment into the state. And last but not least, the $595 million has turned into over a $3 billion economic impact just in that $595. Then you add on top of that the valuation of startup companies and the uh, private invest, private and federal investment, and it's size. Tin Investco, it's only four years old, but it's a $200 million tax credit for venture capital. So what they've designated is five venture capital firms in the state of Tennessee, four in Nashville, one in Memphis. And they take that $200 million, they divvy it up, and they invest in startups and uh, entrepreneurial opportunities in the state with one requirement. They have to stay there. They cannot leave the state. They have to stay in the state of Tennessee. And, and they exclusively fund start entrepreneurial startups that remain in the state. Remember that. They remain in the state. We start up things here, and they leave. The Research Triangle Park, and we know it's legendary. I mean, it began in 1950, I think 1957 or 1958, Joel, they broke yeah. ground for the Research Triangle Park. Wow, what brilliance and visionaries that, that resided in, in what was a very backwards, deep south state in that time, in that era. So it, again, it's a triangulated partnership between government and private sector and the research universities. Today, they have over 50,000 full-time employees with a payroll value of $2.8 billion. Uh, the NC, Bi NC Biotech Center received $200 million in funding. The, the funding came from, and this is really a bright idea, the funding came from the retirement system of North Carolina. Hmm. Now, if you look at how much money is sitting in the retirement system in North Carolina, it's not even a rounding error. Small amount of money. And with that $200 million, they've raised over $1.2 billion in venture capital. So the 200 million had a six-time multiplier of invest, reinvestment back in, in that area. And in 2004, they had the great idea to have a strategic plan to expand the biotech sector in North Carolina. 
and also to improve K-12 STEM education. Now, that was then. North Carolina has changed politically. It's a lot more conservative. And Georgia, Virginia, when you're there next week for Christmas, you'll probably find out, you'll hear a lot about what's going on in North Carolina. It's not as progressive as it once was. But there's some really smart people who took the research trying to park where it is. And then we get to the Alabama Research Alliance. Anybody ever heard of the ARA? Raise your hand if you've heard of it. That's one, that's two, that's three, that's four. It's pretty much unfunded. It was set up by Governor Siegelman during his four years in office. Uh, and in the past five years, they have let out less than $10 million. Now, you can't compete with $200 million and 10 in Vesco and $200 million from um, the retirement system in North Carolina and $595 million over 24 years. So what does that work out to? Two million a year, maybe? And it's, guess what? When it gets distributed, it's political. Imagine that. It currently resides under the Department of Commerce. Um, and in 2009, there was a roadmap, Alabama Science and Technology Roadmap, that a lot of people spent a lot of time on. Some of you in this room might have been on the, uh, uh, on the committee that worked on this. And we needed $500,000 to get the Alabama Science and Technology Roadmap into fruition, and our state wouldn't fund it. Now think about how diverse we are here. We are one of the most diverse states in the country when it comes to our science and technology. When you think about aerospace, when you think about life sciences and biotechnology, when you think about uh, the equine and veterinary medicine research that offer, when you think about what goes on at Tuskegee and materials research, we have a very di a diverse scientific and technology base in this state. Yet we couldn't raise $500,000 to get a roadmap to make it clear and, and, and effective. So, as you can see, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia are billions ahead of Alabama. Now, you probably, I didn't have a number on here for Colorado, but I'll tell you how it happened. Republican Governor Bill Owens was tired of reading headlines in the Wall Street Journal and papers around the country about what is going on in uh, Highway 128 corridor in Boston, Memorial Avenue in Boston, uh, the Research Triangle Park, and what's going on in Silicon Valley. So he convened the top 10 CEOs, the top 10 financial institutions, and all the presidents of the research universities in Colorado and said, I am going to invest in our state becoming a, a huge player in technology, economic and technology development. And they all laughed at him. He said, nope, you're going to clear your calendars. I'm going to schedule these every quarter. I'm going to bring in Bill Gates. I'm going to bring in uh, Steve Jobs is still alive then. I'm going to bring in uh, the CEO of the major think tanks and the Research Triangle Park and all these people. I'll pay for that. I expect you to come out with a plan. And that's how Colorado got on the technology roadmap. It was top-down leadership. So now, let's look at research funding for these 10 states. This is kind of fascinating. Um, there's one thing, and this is for 2013, and researchamerica.org, I find, has a tremendous amount of information. But if you look at uh, the state, the research dollars, the national rank, and the population rank, you know, North Carolina, one point, almost 1.4 billion in research dollars. And that includes everything you can imagine. It's all the research funding that comes into the state, NIH, NSF, all other sources. You get down, look at Florida. Four years ago, that was less than $400 million. Again, Jeff Bush had a vision for what Florida could become. Uh, Colorado, uh, four years ago, that was about $323 million. Look at Alabama, we're $373 million, uh, where our national rank is 23rd, our population rank is 23rd. Um, it's important to see this only because when you think about, those are a lot of dollars coming into just these 10 states. Are we really taking advantage of those? Are we really transferring those to business opportunities and, and, and um, licensing opportunities? So now here's really, I did a 10 year comparison. Let's compare venture capital investment in several southeastern states in Colorado. I did a lot of this one. 
Okay, a 10 year trend in 00 to 2010. North Carolina got about 1.7 billion in venture capital investment, 194 deals. Colorado, 895 million in 66 deals. On and on and on. Look at Alabama, 13 million dollars in VC deals, and this is in life sciences and biotech, in venture capital investment over a 10 year period, and six deals. Now, I don't have a slide for this, but let me tell you about it. In that 10-year period, Alabama as a whole got about $2.8 billion in life sciences funding. $2.8 billion. Colorado, $3.1 billion. What's that, $300 million, give or take, a few dollars right here? They took their $3.1 billion and turned it into $895 million of venture capital. We took $2.8 million and turned it into $13 million. So we've got work to do. Does, uh, to what extent, some of the deals are unreported? There could be that. Uh, you know, I, I go to uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers Money True, Eric. Uh, I find a lot of people use them. I don't know. You know, there, there could definitely be an underreporting going on there. In, in so, is your puzzle a puzzle? North Carolina, Colorado, Georgia, and Tennessee understand the value of top-down, bottom-up leadership and technology investment. Alabama has hunted elephants and ignored the federal investment in research, research and uh, R&D dollars with state technology funding. Think about the huge amount of R&D dollars that come into our state. I'm going to show you something in a minute that's going to kind of blow you away. And then, technology license and commercialization really is a must economic development strategy for our state. So, how did the group steal science? Well, look at this. And this came out of the Alabama Science and Technology Roadmap uh, white paper on technology commercialization, that the group I was telling you about in 08 and 09. It was really, I think it was Governor Riley that started this. But we've had a tremendous investment in bricks and mortar, intellectual capital, and R&D grew by 148% in Alabama versus 25% for the national average, 97 to 06. That's a big number. When you look at what the national average is versus how much we have had invested in our state in R&D, intellectual capital, bricks and mortar. And you think about it. You got Redstone, you have NASA that all comes into this mix. You have the research university. It has nothing to do with football at Tuscaloosa. It has nothing to do with anything other than this is just pure R&D dollars. You're a ranking member of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Didn't hurt, Rich. You're right. <laughs> Next. According to the Coffin Foundation, Alabama ranks near the bottom in our region in terms of entrepreneurial activity. I will correct that. We rank near the bottom of the country, as, I, as you saw by evidence by the 2014 and 86% of Alabama venture capital is invested out of the state, and that came directly out of the Alabama Science and Technology Roadmap Study. And this is their, their under overlying theme. Without state-supported leadership and funding for commercialization, Alabama will never reach its full economic potential. And you know, I'm just honorary enough and stubborn enough to believe that's just not going to, that we, we can't sit here and take that. So how did we wrench the Grinch? So, I think the private sector has to take a bolder leadership position. I think the big ideas in this state has to be a partnership between the private sector and the research universities to move things up. It has to come bottom up. Number two, at all Alabama research universities, intellectual property disclosures, patent filings, licensing, commercialization opportunities are hugely important. And I cannot underscore those enough. They're hugely important. That's why, George, every time I, I see you and meet with you, I'm in awe of what you have done with regards. But what, as impressive as that is, it's what you have created that we could take and, and create a, a business model off of. And work with university administrators, elected officials, and the private sector to deploy the 10 vital action steps from the research uh, universities in the future of America. Really, the, the 
gift under the tree is taking our brilliance, our intellectual capacity, and transferring that to opportunities that we never envisioned. So, it's party like it's 1999. <laughs> or as Grumpy Cat said, the Grinch gave the presents back. WTF. <laughs> anyway, that's it. That's how the Grinch sold science. Uh, I didn't see anyone sleeping, but I saw some of you which they were really smart folks. Uh, anyway, if you have some questions, I would love to try to answer them. The interesting thing to say the private sector needs to take the leadership. What is the what is the force that's going to make that happen? Yeah. Oh, I, I think you know that's a good question. Um, I think it's getting us in a room. Uh, you know, um, like uh, I, I don't want to pick on Rich, but we work very closely with this company out of Washington D.C. And they marry us up with business opportunities. And I'll give you an example. Um, we've been working this year to get Boeing onto UAB's campus to look at our cybersecurity work, our materials uh, engineering, and some other things. Well, we did. When we met with Boeing, first of all, they said, UAB has a school of engineering. Now, this particular office for Boeing is headquartered in Huntsville. But it took a meeting in Washington to get them interested in Huntsville to come to Birmingham. So I think it's just more outreach like that, George, of bringing the, the, the private sector to us, or us going to the private sector, and sitting down and trying to find uh, collaborative points, research and development points, or opportunities that we can like, likewise work on. So does that answer? Is, is that the state government, local government? Um, where does things like the BBA fit into that strategy? <laughs> <clears throat> I, I think we have different perspectives. Uh, you know, they, they're supposed to be an economic development organization, and, and I think it has, that's a difficult transition from being a, 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 a typical um, chamber of commerce, if you will. It's a, it's a different mindset. I do believe in the next year, I think in two years, I think that the BBA is going to continue to evolve where it is really more focused on economic development. And because it's here in Birmingham, it pretty much has to be technology-based economic development. It can't be going out and trying to get the next, I mean, heck, there aren't a lot of elephants left to shoot, but maybe there's, you know, maybe they think, you know, some puppies, you know, or some kittens. Um, I think we've got to work closer. Next. I think we have to be more in tune and parallel with what, what we're, what's going on here with them. Now, we've certainly, we've brought some opportunities to the BBA, um, and they have brought some opportunities to us, but I think it's, it has to strengthen. On the subject of the BBA, uh, we're actually... chosen is actually uh, sort of biomanufacturing, medical technology devices and, and uh, drug development. And the idea is just to identify a region, it can't be a whole state. And so the, the teleconference that got it kicked off a couple of weeks ago, uh, and this is after many false starts with other, other industries that we looked at, uh, involves, you know, everything from Huntsville, Hudson Alkins, down to McConnell. Uh, Tim and the company earlier this summer put together a a medical device oriented proposal. Right? And, and that was actually to get real funding. This is, this, this is for a designation that opens up uh, preferred opportunities to about 11 different funding and government funding agencies. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, we can use a lot of not only the spirit, but some of the, the technical content and leads in that proposal as a nucleus for it. So as that evol it evolves, if there's anybody in this room that is interested in it, we really need hardest thing at this moment is, is to really get forward momentum now. Um, it's a strange proposal for me because it's rare that I write it would, would be involved in putting together a proposal that, that in 
involves not directly getting money, but, but this simply gives you access, preferred access to it. But I think more importantly than that, it goes to the point of getting industry together with us uh, to form a more powerful, organized consortium concerning all aspects of the supply chain up to the manufacturers themselves. So let's see if we can get any traction on that and it actually leads to something concrete. But we certainly need input and advice, uh, all levels from the business side uh, through to the technical side. I'll give you another example. Um, we're working on a um, richest partner in Washington, David Olive, called me one day and says, do you guys have this capability? Oh, we have it. We're exceptional. I can't really go into it a great deal of what it is because we have non-disclosure agreements. Um, but we are working on a security effort that could completely change the way organizations look at securing their facilities, keeping people safer. Uh, and that's it. That's all I'm going to say. If you want um, no, no, we can't do that. But what's happened, what's going to come out of this is, once again, a government agency that's going to allow us potentially to start a company. So things are beginning to happen, but it, it's a slow process because funding is not easily available in this community. Um, I, I go to, like, I look at Chattanooga. I'm sorry, David, I'm probably cut into your time here. But, Chattanooga right now has about $50 million in venture capital available. All of a sudden, all these startups are flocking to Chattanooga. And why? You got a room full of smart people. Give me, what, what's the answer? Money. Full play. <laughs> no, but I tell you why. 33% of the reason Volkswagen chose to go Chattanooga is the same answer I'm looking for. It has to do with their, their hmm? uh, broadband network. Mm -hmm. Joel gets it. Yeah. They have one gig broadband. One gig broadband. And with that has been just a, it's like a magnet. All these startups and companies. There's, there's a startup out of Auburn that bypasses Birmingham and goes straight to Chattanooga. It's called getbellhops.com. If you want, if you know anybody that wants to move, Inexpensively and efficiently, go on to getbellhops.com. Guys started in Auburn and they bypassed here and they go straight to Chattanooga. They've got resources. And, but that was one billion dollar expenditure. No, it wasn't. Paid for by the public. It wasn't a billion. It was two hundred and fifty-seven million. We invite that. Home. <laughs> wow, I like that. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, I hope I've given you something to think about. Um, it's why Michelle and Claudia, I keep on saying we've got, we've got some great science there. Let's do something with it. Um, you know, we do. We have depth here. We have brilliance here. We have intellectual capacity in our 90-some square blocks here in Birmingham that is unmatched. And I believe in so much what the opportunities are. I just want to see us Take it and run. So, thank you all very much. The reason I cut you off is we promised to be out of here within an hour, and I think we've always stayed within that. And in order to uh, end this conversation, we'll have an opportunity to carry on because we asked all of you just to join us in the cafe for some um, refreshments. Um, and then, but those of you who have been here before, and I've got to the point I have to read this bit myself. Have you seen this? No. I say you have been out to make collisions. We 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 started off giving the presenter at the Edge Chaos Scholars <laughs> Lecture a coffee cup from the Edge Chaos, and our first one was a began a tradition. Our second one developed into an honored tradition. Our third one became a long-standing honored tradition. Then fourthly, it became a very important, long-standing, honored tradition. Then as we moved into our fifth presenter, it became a cherished, important, long-standing, <laughs> honored tradition. Then we had the esteemed, cherished, important, long-standing, honored tradition. But with that today, Dennis, I present you with the prestigious, <laughs> esteemed, Cherished, important.
supported, long-standing, honored tradition of the Edge Chaos Coffee Bar. Oh, thank you. Thank you.